You know, saving for higher education for children or grandchildren can be a lot like trying to plan a vacation five years in the future. There's a lot that can happen that can derail that vacation, whether it's a storm or a change of desire. And so today we want to explore the different types of investment options that are out there to save for education. You know, Spencer, both of our families have a lot of kids. And with that, each of the kids are gifted and unique in different ways. And so when I think about saving for college for my family in particular, their needs are gonna be different and their desires are probably gonna be different as well. So when we think about college savings vehicles for our kids, we can think about three, in primary, three primary options. We've got the 529 plan, we've got the Roth IRA, and we've got a traditional non-qualified account. So let's start off and let's talk about these 529 plans. They're qualified education savings programs. What are some really key things that people need to know about those? Well, when we start with the 529 plan, it's really geared towards saving towards education. You're going to get tax benefit on that if you keep those funds there and then you ultimately use them for qualified educational purposes. This used to just be college, now it also includes K through 12 education up to a certain amount in tuition. But the government put in place these amendments to the tax code basically to say if you put the resources there and you keep them there and you allow them to grow, you're not going to pay tax on the gains. You're also not going to pay tax on dividends or interest year to year. So it is a nice benefit for those plans, but there's also some drawbacks to those plans that we'll talk about. So. Why would the government give these tax benefits to these qualified tuition education programs like a 529? Well, it's just incentivizing us to make education a priority. If we look at the statistics, we've, we can see that those with a college degree are going to have a higher level of median earning than those with a high school degree. Those with advanced degrees are even gonna be higher, generally speaking. So the government knows that it's in its long-term interest to be able to incentivize saving for education so then there's a greater capacity to actually engage in education when that point comes because college education can be expensive. You know, here in the state of Tennessee, you might spend six figures on a four-year education for one of the flagship universities. That's uh, not cheap. And then we think about private schools and others that might even be far more expensive. So it's something that if we get to that point and we've not saved at all, it can feel overwhelming and it could dissuade somebody from going to college. So the government says, well, we want to provide a nudge and, and get this on your radar screen. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, if the government is harvesting only the gains of those accounts, and let's say parents, grandparents invest 20, 30, 40,000, and that grows to 50 or 60, then they're sacrificing $30,000 of capital gains. The government is on that tax. But if the lifetime earnings for that person if they're, the, according to College Board, the median earnings of someone that's 60 to 64 with a high school diploma is 43000 whereas the median income of a 25 to 29-year-old with just a bachelor's degree is just about $50,000. And so you think about the lifetime earnings of someone with a bachelor's degree, well, if the government can get that $10,000 a year and see the increase over a year, it makes sense why the government would give those tax incentives. Absolutely. And we think about the different ways that a 529 can even be set up. So it's pretty flexible. You could have a parent set one up. You could have a grandparent. You could have a godparent set one up, an aunt or an uncle. Uh, we, we need an owner and a beneficiary essentially there. Now the owner is going to be the one making all the decisions. The beneficiary would receive those benefits. And there's some things that we need to be you know, aware of there. What are the places that we can actually use a 529 plan though? Yeah, so 529 plans, like you were saying, most of the time, uh, up until recently, it was only able to use for higher education. Now you can use it for K through 12. That, there's a limit there of $10,000 a year that you can use for K through 12 education. But then once you get into university, qualified education expenses include things like tuition and fees. It includes, for college students, books and supplies, computer, software, internet access, room and board, Student has to be enrolled half time. And it can at also least half time, at right? At least half time. Yeah. And then student loans. So there's a lifetime limit of $10,000 that they can be used for student loans. So really, a 529 plan is really flexible as long as you're using it for education. So if we're not using it for education, what do we need to be aware of there? 
you can always withdraw the money that you have put in at any time. So let's say I invested $10,000. That that is my basis. So I can withdraw that tax-free and penalty-free. Now, if the account grows to $20,000 and we use it for something that's not education related, then there's going to be a 10% penalty and I'm going to be taxed on any of that gain. Uh, um, and that will be included in earned income. So it's not going to be included in capital gains like a normal investment would. It's going to be earned income. So we've got some penalties there if we don't use it for those educational expenses that maybe we set out to in that analogy of looking five years into the future for a vacation, all kinds of things can come up. Maybe we, can, we can't go to that particular beach or nobody likes to go to the beach anymore. Yeah. So we've got to grapple with some of those trade-offs, it sounds like, just right. as in this. Now, if, if we think we've talked about some of the benefits, what are some of the other benefits that we've not yet talked about for 529 plans? Yeah, so one of the benefits, especially if you've got wealthy parents or grandparents, they can super fund a 529 plan. So think about this in this regard. Any person can gift up to $17,000 per year tax-free to anybody else. So if you have a grandparent or anybody, godparent, aunt, uncle, someone that wants to give a generous sum of money, they can give up to five years and super fund an education. So if you have $17,000 a year for five years, they can super fund it up to $85,000. Now that's a one-time thing that they can do for that five-year period, but if you do that when a child is young and then allow that investment to grow over time, they could have a tremendous sum of money to be able to go to just about anywhere for their education expenses. So if we've got a lot of cash on the sidelines and we want to put that someplace that's tax efficient mm -hmm. and focused on education for a particular child or a group of children, yeah. then this seems like a, a nice place to be. Yeah, it's a really nice benefit. The other thing is states with income taxes, there's some states that will give you some flexibility on the state income tax. So if you invest in California, let's say, California has state income taxes, you might be able to get some tax credit or tax refund. It's state by state specific, so you really need to check and see what your state allows for these things. But there could be some nice benefits if you invest in your own state's plan. Of course, we're located here in Tennessee. We don't have a Tennessee income tax, so there's no benefit there right. to residents of Tennessee, but for a lot of other states, as you mentioned, yeah. it, there is a, quite a nice benefit. Yeah. And with the SECURE Act 2.0, one of the other benefits that we've seen is that you can do a rollover from a 529 plan into a Roth IRA. So let's say a child graduates from college and they've got $35,000 left over in the 529 plan. Well, the owner can do one of two things. They can say, I want to transfer the beneficiary to some other beneficiary which you can do with a 529 plan. Or you can say, hey, let's roll that over into a Roth IRA for you. Now you have to do that over the course of several years. The 529 plan has to been open for at least 15 years. And your rollover amount annually is subject to the annual threshold. So if you can only contribute $6,000 to a Roth IRA because that's all you've earned, then that's all you can roll over from that 529. So it's, it's subject to all the traditional caps that a Roth IRA would be subjected to. So this is a nice point in that if we have some leftover funds, especially for a 529 plan, and we want to equalize passing on resources to multiple different children, then we can, if, if one child didn't use all of it, then we can push that to, to his or her Roth IRA. The other thing that that brings up is being able to shift beneficiaries, and you alluded to that, but if they are in that same kind of lineage, and, and really if we have grandparents that set up a 529 and they're the owners, then any of their grandkids, they can move the beneficiary across that line. If it's a parent, um, then we have a little bit less flexibility, but it tends to be any of their children. And then if they don't use it, then grandchildren down one line. But that can be interesting because they might need to wait you know, another 25 years. Right, if grandchildren even funds. come. Yeah, exactly. So that brings up a good point. One of the downsides of 529 plans is you don't want to overfund it. When you think about that situation, if you have put so much money in that students aren't going to use, there's no way to get it back without penalty or tax. Now, you could roll it into the fi to an, a Roth IRA, but again, that's, we want to have, that's why we need to have goals for these accounts because we don't want to get into that point where we don't know what to do with the money. What are some other downsides, Spencer? Well, 
there's a logistical element that we've got to keep track of. And it's not necessarily uh, all that difficult in most circumstances. The easiest circumstance you would say might be that you have half of the funds that you need for a college education in a 529 plan, and you just decide that every semester you're going to uh, write a check or have the 529 plan distribute funds directly to the college for the tuition expense. That would be very easy because you're really only having to touch it twice a year for the student. So maybe only eight times over the course of a college uh, career. Uh, the thing that gets a little bit more dicey is when we've got to use those funds to pay for things like housing, uh, room and board, books, uh, being able to track those receipts potentially. Or if we're in kind of a thorny situation where a student maybe is going to a junior college or maybe a, a four-year institution and they're living at home and now we're trying to track that expense. Those can be a little bit more of a challenge. So there is a logistical element to the 529 that we want to recognize if we're going to get that qualified education expense recognized, sometimes we've got to have the receipts accordingly. Right. All right, so let's shift. We've got that qualified, that qualified education program, 529s. Let's shift to a non-qualified account. So this is generally an after-tax account. What do we need to know about just non-qualifieds and saving for college education? Well, this gives us the most flexibility, actually. Um, if we just save and we keep the account in the ownership of the individual who's going to be making those gifts, then they have complete flexibility. They're not, they, they could give the funds to the child for something other than educational expenses. So they're not locked into that educational path. They could use it for retirement. They could use it for all kinds of other charitable gifts if they wanted to. All kinds of different pieces. The trade-off is the taxation. You don't get any tax benefit from it. If you're a parent and you keep those resources in non-qualified or you set up an account that might be an UTMA or UGMA account for the beneficiary, for the student, in both of those scenarios, you can have a significant impact on reducing your financial aid. So you have to be careful about that as well. A 529 plan doesn't typically have as much of a drawback to the need-based financial aid oftentimes as a non-qualified account would. So you get a lot of flexibility over here, but at the same time, you don't get the tax benefit and sometimes it can hurt financial aid. What, what else would you say about that non-qualified? Yeah, you know, there's some interesting ways that you can structure a non-qualified account to really benefit that next generation too. So we think about, again, that gift limitation, the annual gift limitation. So if you've got two parents or two grandparents that want to help fund education, well, oftentimes a student's income is not going to be very high. So if the parents or grandparents want to gift shares of stock to that next generation, then the student can then sell it. Now, again, they have to be a student that you trust because yeah. then they have to use those funds to then pay for their tuition. But that's a way to move, to shift the capital gains onto a, a, another person that does not have as much income. And we remember that the capital gains bracket, there's zero tax on capital gains from $0 to 44000 So if the student's not making any income, two grandparents can give up to $34,000. That's a, a significant portion that they can help with education. And the way that that might work is you have highly appreciated Apple stock, mm -hmm. for instance, and if you sold it, then you got to pay 15 or 18.8 or even 23.8% tax on the gains. Yeah. If you gift it to the grandchild and you do things correctly and they file their own tax return, you may have no tax due on that. So again, on $34,000, if we're thinking about uh, taxation that might be you know in that 20% range, that might be a savings of $7,000 yeah. or so. So it can be significant. So we've talked about some of the benefits. It's really flexible. There's tax downsides to holding funds in a non-qualified account. So capital gains, if you sell those stocks, then you're going to have to pay capital gains tax. You've got the headwinds of dividends and those other things. So there's a headwind to those non-qualified accounts that's not the same as if they were growing tax-free in a 529 plan. And the way that we could even think about that, if we had it very conservatively invested, let's just say, and we're getting 5% as a rate of return from some combination of corporate bonds and treasury bonds there, if we've got to pay tax on that of 25, 30, even 35%, depending on what state rates are in addition to the federal tax bracket, that can mean that, you know, 
2% even of that income might be sacrificed. So we, we think about that and it's a significant headwind uh, potentially for the level of growth. Now, the principle again is, is very easy to be able to utilize in, in each of these cases, but we're really thinking about how do I position the account so that the gains are easiest to be able to utilize for the purposes I want. One other thing that we want to provide as a general idea, makes sense in a lot of circumstances, but not all circumstances, if we have grandparents that have saved funds via non-qualified and they want to pass on those resources to their grandkids for educational spending, typically it makes the most sense to be able to pass that to the parents first as a gift and then let the parents pay for the student's expenses. If the gift is direct to the student, then that can be categorized in ways that harm financial aid. So oftentimes we, we have that gift that passes from grandparents to parents and then the parents pay the bill uh, rather than grandparents paying off that bill. So we've talked 529, we've talked non-qualified. There's a third way to save that some folks haven't even heard of for educational expenses. What's, what's that third way? Yeah, Spencer, so if we think about a non-qualified account, it gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility. A 529 plan is a lot more limited. You have to use it for education. We think about the Roth and there's a really unique opportunity that clients have to be able to pay for education from a Roth IRA. So if you've been saving into your Roth, let's say for 20 years, putting the annual limit in there, you could have a fairly substantial amount in principle in that Roth IRA. And with that Roth, you can take that principle out anytime, penalty free and tax free. And so if you are gonna go pay for college and you have a student but you haven't really saved specifically for education in either that 529 or that non-qualified account, you can draw out of that principal to then pay for education expenses for your student. And the thing that we like about this is you get that tax-free growth on the amount that, that has that gain. So we don't want to touch that for educational expenses, but we can allow that part to continue to grow towards retirement while using that principle. One of the things that we've got to be aware of though is if we take a distribution there, it can impact financial aid, mm -hmm. specifically need-based aid. Because <clears throat> if we fill out the FAFSA, the beloved document that tells colleges how much we make and how much we have, the FAFSA will include that Roth distribution as what's called a non-taxable income mm -hmm. amount. So that can impact that need-based financial aid. So we've got to be careful about that. So sometimes what we see clients doing is just using distributions from a Roth IRA for the last two years of school because a FAFSA filing is a two-year look back. So if we only use Roth IRA resources from principal for junior and senior year, oftentimes we can avoid that non-taxable filing on the FAFSA that might impact need-based financial aid. Now, for families that they're not going to get need-based financial aid, then there's not really the same downside. Right, right. And really, again, as we come back to the Roth, just like we talked about with the 529, it is a specific account that oftentimes has a specific goal. And with Roth accounts, that goal is saving for retirement. So once you hit that 59 and a half mark, that's when principal and gain can be taken out tax-free, penalty-free. And so you gotta remember, the primary saving vehicle for education is not a Roth IRA. It's a secondary feature that you can take out that principal. So again, we come back to what's the goal? And if we don't have that goal, then this is a good option. We've got principal in a Roth, let's go ahead and take it out. But it doesn't satisfy, it's, it's a little bit of a, a twist on how we think about savings for college. We hope that this has been a helpful discussion of the different kinds of vehicles available to save towards college education expenses. In the next episode, what we're going to do is unpack three different situations of families saving towards those educational expenses and the trade-offs that they face as they evaluate their decisions. Until then, we hope you have a great time. Take care. If you like these financial planning videos, please share with a friend. And if you have questions, 
go to our website at SeriousRetirement.com. This content was provided by Retirement Planning Services. We are located in Knoxville, Tennessee. You can visit our website at SeriousRetirement.com. The information in this recording is intended for general educational and informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advisory, financial planning, legal, tax, or other professional advice based on your specific situation. Please consult with your professional advisor before taking any action based on its contents. Advisory services offered through Retirement Planning Services, LLC.